Friends, welcome to this daily devotion. I'm Pastor Mark, and I have the privilege of serving the United Methodist Church of the Frankfurt, Mokina, and New Lenox areas. I ask that you come to this time with an open heart and an open mind. Ready yourself that we may truly come into the presence of God and leave transformed as people living in abundant life. Friends, hear the invocation. Almighty God, you are the light and life of every soul and my only source of hope. Grant that in this time of worship, I may experience your transforming power, preparing me for the ministry of the day. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, our theme this week as we approach Palm Sunday is the wounds and sorrows of ministry. I wish I could tell you that following Christ will solve all your financial problems, that you'll never get hurt again, that no one will ever say a mean word to you, that discipleship and ministry, that doing the right thing is always, always going to lead to, to ease of comfort and security. And, and, and for some people, it does seem to do that. But I think for authentic people of faith, and, and this is true of any Uh, faith that I have experienced with and and certainly true of Christianity. Life is still difficult. And and the more you grow to love others, the more your heart breaks for them. We saw that lived out in the person of Jesus Christ. So, what truly are the wounds and sorrow of ministry? Do we decide in the midst of that to continue anyway. Our theme psalm is Psalm 52. Uh, Today we'll just do the first four verses. God have mercy on me because I'm being trampled. All day long my enemy oppresses me. My attackers trample me all day long because I have so many enemies. Exalted one, whenever I'm afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise. I trust in God, I won't be afraid. What can mortal flesh do to me? God bless the reading of the psalm. I love, I love that phrase. Yet when we when we read the psalm, sometimes there's a story context that's super important. And, and this is attributed to King David when he had been captured by a foreign army, by the Philistines. So this is not like, Oh, the person at Starbucks messed up my order. Like this is this is not the kind of uh, the kind of trauma that we we create. And I'm not I'm not trying to make fun of. Like it's it messes up your day, right? Um, if, if things don't go well, like I, I get it. But like I I want to emphasize that that David's crying out from in in a sense being a prisoner of war. Things are not going well, and that's often how he cries. Things are not going well. And so he recognizes the reality. He's not he's not being like um, false. He's not being like a like a, a, a extreme optimist. Oh, this is great! I'm a uh, I'm surrounded by the enemy. I'm you know being besieged upon all sides. Everything's wonderful. No, he he acknowledges the pain of reality. I'm being trampled all day long. They they are they are oppressing me. They're trampling me. There's so many enemies on my left, on my right, above me, below me. But whenever I'm afraid, I put my trust in God. And I love this last this last phrase, I trust God, I won't be afraid. How, how many times in scripture does, does God or an angel or a faithful person or even Jesus Christ remind us not to be afraid? Do not be afraid. And yet if we look around our world, even among Christians, there's so much fear. So much fear. It, it, I, have, I have great compassion for it, but it also irritates me. Because there are some things that that Scripture says should should just flow from us, from people of faith, and and being not afraid is one of those things. And again, it's okay to be afraid. There's plenty of examples of people being afraid. The reality is we should be working towards a non-fear state, 
and we should be very careful not to breed fear. And if we're involved in that, then we have a real problem. And why aren't, why aren't we afraid? Because what could anyone do to me? What could any one person do to me? Defame me? Imprison me? Take my life? No one can do anything compared to what God can do. God can raise me from the dead. God can heal my wounds. God can restore my sight. Allow me to walk again. Allow me to hear. Allow me to love. Give me peace and words to speak in time of trial and trouble. God can restore my life. Forgive my sins. What can mortal men do to me? Our anthology reading comes from Spirituality for Ministry by Urban T. Holmes. Many persons, ordained or not, live in a fairly constant state of noise, with their unresolved past and uncertain present breaking in on them. They lack a certain still center, and it is only for such a quiet point that we can listen attentively. When I was in my first parish, which was located in the middle of the city, a constant stream of indignance came through. One came into my office and wanted to tell me his story. I sat as if to listen, but was deeply troubled inside over some issue not long forgotten. I remember I was fiddling with a pencil. The man stopped his story, looked at me, and said, Young father, the least you can do is listen. He was right. There was no still center in me. Thomas Merton found the busy life of the Trappist very disconcerting. Despite the fact that speaking is severely curtailed in the monastery, he found the place incredibly noisy. For many years he sought permission to live as a hermit on the property of the monastery. He needed the quiet that he might listen. Too frequently we do not understand the hermit's discipline a discipline that needs to be ours in spirit, if not in fact. I think so often as we are thinking about wounds and sorrows, so often we don't allow ourselves time to heal. We don't allow ourselves space to acknowledge sorrow, grief. And, and, and grief isn't just about losing someone you love. Uh, grief is not just about someone in your life dying. Grief is about losing an ability. Grief is about losing a job. Grief is about a transition in life. Grief is about going from one pay scale to another pay scale that's, that's less than, uh, if unintentional or unexpected. Grief is, is transition. Grief is losing the ability to drive, losing the ability to see. Grief is uh, your child struggling, suffering, not being the same as they used to be. Grief is saying goodbye to a friend, not because they're dying, because they're moving. Grief is the end of a marriage. Grief is acknowledgement of hitting rock bottom. There's so much sorrow and so, and we don't always acknowledge it. The first step of any recovery program, any uh, AA, etc., is to acknowledge that there's an issue. And sometimes it's in that still, quiet time that we can say, "I, I have a problem," because it's easy to fill the void. It's easy to just cloud yourself with noise, especially today. It's easier than ever. We, we can scroll and we can talk and we can, we can surround ourselves with something instead of just being. 
being present, even in just a moment. And, 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 you know, yeah, maybe it would be good for all of us to take a whole day or take a week or take a month to sit in still, quiet silence. But but even just a moment, just a minute, five, 15 minutes in the busyness of my life, which is very, very busy, believe me, I have to find those quiet times in the hectic busyness of my morning. And I don't always get it, but generally even 15 minutes where I can just sit and be still. I encourage you to carve out some time. Turn everything off. You're not listening to music. You're not listening to a podcast. You're not, you don't, you know, the phone is off. You're undistracted. Five minutes. Don't think about anything. Don't feel, just be. Try to turn everything off. Take a deep breath. Just be. Our scripture reading today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ be blessed. He is the compassionate Father and God of comfort. He's the one who comforts us in our trouble so that we can comfort other people who are in every kind of trouble. We offer the same comfort that we ourselves receive from God. That is because we receive so much comfort through Christ in the same way that we share so many of Christ's sufferings. So if we have trouble, it is to bring you comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is to bring you comfort from the experience of endurance while you go through the same suffering that we also suffered. Our hope for you is certain because we know you are partners in suffering. You are also partners in comfort. Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be unaware of the troubles that we went through in Asia. We were weighed down with a long, with a load of suffering that was far beyond our strength. We were afraid we might not survive. It certainly seemed to us as if we had gotten the death penalty. This was so. We would have the confidence in God who raises the dead instead of ourselves. God rescued us from a terrible death. He will rescue us. We have set our hope on him. He will rescue us again. Since you are helping <coughs> excuse me, with your prayer for us, then many people can thank God on our behalf for the gift that was given to us through the prayers of many people. God bless the reading of the epistle today. Again, Paul in the early church, writing from a place of real suffering, real struggle, real oppression. And I love these words. God has comforted us so we can be comforted and offer comfort to others. And he says, even when we are comfortable, we use that comfort to offer other people comfort. It's not for ourselves, it's for others. If you are at a good place in your life, you have a distinct opportunity to offer comfort to other people whose lives are not so in a good place. I recognize Going back through my life, there have been ups and downs. There have been valleys. There has been darkness. There has been trauma. And there is certainly a busyness and a hecticness in my life right now. And so I know how I endured and we as a family endured those trials and tribulations. I know because of our faith. I know because of the encouragement of others. And so if I am in any good place, if I am in any spot to do the same, I am called to do the same. And it's a blessed ministry. To encourage each other, to comfort each other, to support each other. I think for me, that's, that's at the heart of what it means to be the church. A church is a community of people with wounds and sorrows who come together to support each other, to hold each other, to comfort each other, to love each other, and to reach out to a world and do the same. Friends, today I offer you an opportunity for confession. Confession is an act of letting go. It's an act of seeking forgiveness and receiving. Hopefully it moves us to making amends, to apologizing, 
and to moving forward. Let us now bring to God all those things we would confess. Friends, hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Let us move forward, growing in love, love of God and love of neighbor. Let us pray the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.